justice was swift for Ned Kellogg. From May Wickline's murder to the day of his sentencing, it was but 46 days. He spent the next 22 years in prison. In 1967, he died there at the age of 73. Police and public may have found the case to be straightforward, clear cut, simple. It was anything but. May Wickline's body was discovered on a frigid morning in January 1945 on what was then the western outskirts of the quiet college town. Most of the crime scene is long gone, having been bulldozed 40 years ago for a multi-lane highway. Wickline was 49. Born near Pittsburgh, she eventually lived and worked in Warren, Ohio, and by 1925 had moved to Kent. She got a job as a clerk at Thompson's Drugstore, and in 1940, moved across the town square to a similar position at Standard Drug. During her 20 years in Kent, Wickline became one of the best known and most popular workers in Kent. She talked, joked, and commiserated with the store's customers. Children loved it when she would sneak them a piece of penny candy when their parents weren't looking. Soldiers and sailors home on leave from World War II chatted with her and told her of their adventures. And the women students at nearby Kent State University confided in her about their boyfriends, their classes, and their homesickness. Brookline bowled in a league, had no serious boyfriends, but did socialize with a small circle of friends and co-workers. In 1945, Wickline was rooming with a family on Stowe Street, about a half mile from her job, within easy walking distance. The winter of 1945 was nasty, even for Northeast Ohio. Late January had seen day after day of freezing temperatures and even more snow than usual. Kent State co-eds had convinced Wickline to mail order a pair of stadium boots. They were popular with the women's students for walking across the snowy campus. Wickline's boots were delivered to her workplace on Tuesday, January 23rd. She was eager to try them out. When she got off work shortly after 8 p.m., she took a brown grocery bag and put in a pound of coffee, her work shoes, and the overshoes she had worn to work that morning. Her store manager offered her a ride home. But Wickline declined. She was looking forward to trying out her new boots. At 8.40 p.m., she left the drugstore to start the 20-minute walk home. She took the straightest route, west on Main, across the Erie Railroad tracks and the Cuyahoga River Bridge, south on River, and west on Stowe's. Shortly after she left work, however, a block from her home, Wickline was accosted and murdered. She was left slumped against a chicken coop fence, her skull fractured, her face swollen beyond recognition. Not many people lived on South River Street on the west edge of Kent 70 years ago. A huge old mill on the Cuyahoga River dominated one side of the road. A few houses and the local American Legion building occupied the other side. At the intersection of South River and Stowe Streets, long before the bypass was built, there was a dark brown two-story house that fronted on Stowe Street. Behind the house, along the South River Street side, there was a garage and a rundown chicken coop. It was there that May Wickline was killed. Her body was discovered by a passing motorist shortly after 9 o'clock on the morning of Wednesday, January 24th. 
She was lying on the sidewalk, feet facing north, her hands clenched in front of her. Her face was so badly swollen that the police, who knew her well, did not recognize her. She had to be identified by her clothing. Even though the body was found on the sidewalk, there were signs of a serious struggle 15 feet away by the chicken coop. There was considerable blood on a fence post stub, but the coroner ruled homicide by blunt force trauma to the back of the skull, probably with a pipe or a crowbar. Wickline had not been raped, but her bloody winter coat and scarf were found 15 feet from the body. Police faced an immediate puzzle. If the signs of a scuffle and the bloody post were 15 feet away, how did the body get on the sidewalk? It is believed by police that Miss Wickline regained consciousness after the attack sometime after 11 p.m. and staggered to the sidewalk where she fell on her back. Kent Courier Tribune, January 29, 1945. Clues were not plentiful. A local man who had walked by the South River Street scene the night of the murder told police he had found a brown grocery bag about 100 feet north of where the body was found. The bag contained a pound of coffee and some shoes. Because Wickline's purse had not been found, police began to speculate that this was a robbery attempt gone bad. The developing timeline suggested that someone had followed Wickline when she left work. After she turned south on River Street, near the old mill, she must have been confronted. Frightened, Wickline dropped the grocery bag and ran toward her home, a block and a half away. Her assailant caught up with her 100 feet down the road by the chicken coop where the deadly struggle took place. Police believed the robber then made off with her purse. 24 hours into the investigation, police were pretty confident they had figured out the motive and the circumstances surrounding the murder. Now, they needed a suspect. Ned Kellogg was 51 and had lived in Kent all his life. From an early age, he was seen as being slightly slow mentally. His intellectual development lagged behind other children, and he had a hard time learning and grasping things. Indeed, Kellogg never did attend school. He later would be evaluated to have the mental age of a seven-year-old. If his mental age was maybe estimated to be somewhere between six and nine years of age, I mean, he could learn some rudi rudimentary math skills, number concepts, tell time. Uh, he might have acquired, if he didn't read at all, maybe some sight vocabulary, um, stop, walk, don't walk. As he grew up, he had trouble relating to people and was subject to insults or bullying. He may have been in some cases ridiculed. He, he probably, um, you, you know, once you did probably begin to interact with him, you could tell he was probably somewhat limited or slow, as it may have been referred to then. I think it is possible in terms of terminology that was used back then that he may have been referred to with some of what we consider more derogatory terms, idiot, imbecile, feeble-minded. By age 18, Kellogg had found a low-paying job at the Williams Brothers Flour Mill on North Water Street in Kent. He would work there for the next 30 years, toiling as a laborer and watchman. He did not drive, could not read or write, and did not socialize much with Kent residents. Probably would cons be considered to be maybe in a mild range of mental retardation or in a d intellectual disability. You know, pretty reasonably able to function independently in society. Uh, again, uh, he worked as a laborer, so he wasn't, you know, a highly skilled tradesman, but he, he certainly had to be able to manage his money, pay his rent, uh, pay for his food, clothing. Uh, it appears that he was able to do all those. Obviously, he worked at uh, the Williams Brothers flour mill, I think, for a long period of time, so he, he must have been a, a pretty stable, uh, productive worker. Most folks might have agreed with the local draft board registrar, who noted in 1917 that Kellogg was just not right mentally. Still, over the years, he didn't seem to be a threat to the community or to himself. 
When he was 25 during World War I, Kellogg enlisted in the Army and was assigned to guard railroad depots stateside. Five months into his service, however, he was honorably discharged on a surgeon's certificate of disability, reportedly because of his mental deficiency. He seems to have led a quiet, somewhat isolated life over the years. When he was in his late 40s, he developed a police record. He was convicted twice for window peeping and once for indecent exposure. In 1945, Ned Kellogg was a fairly well-known fixture in the community. Five foot seven, balding, nondescript. Most folks knew and largely ignored him. He was probably just considered part of the community and he got dealt a bad hand in life. And probably, you know, people understood what he was like and went about their daily business and interacted with him. Kent was a busy railroad town in the 1940s, with lots of hobos, train riders, and bums hanging around. Over the four days following the murder, many of them were questioned by authorities, more than 20, according to police. Newspaper headlines captured an intense, exhaustive investigation. Yet within a few days, all the suspects had been released, and police became frustrated. We questioned a number of suspects, but it all simmered down to nothing. It looks like we're right back where we started. Furman Grubb, police chief. The town was on edge. Tips poured in. Women reported having been followed at night by a tall man in a dark coat. Businesses offered a reward. The small police department was feeling pressure to solve the case. Ned Catalog, even though he had a minor police record, had not been one of the 20 men questioned by police. That was about to change. Kent Patrolman Roy Thompson had been trained in criminal investigation in the military and had been working around the clock on the Wickline case. For reasons not clear, even to this day, he decided to question the mill worker. On Sunday afternoon, January 28th, as Kellogg left his job at the mill, Thompson picked him up, brought him to the police station for routine questioning. Two police officers began questioning Kellogg. Shortly after the interview began, he must have said something that immediately grabbed their attention. It was no longer a routine interview. Within an hour, Kellogg was having questions fired at him by the police chief, the county sheriff, three officers, and the county prosecuting attorney. For several hours, they interrogated Kellogg in a small room at the Kent Police Station. This is 1945. We're 19 years before... Uh... Uh, Escobita versus Illinois and Miranda versus Arizona. Uh, there are no rules in the room with respect to um, um, taking his confession or how that interrogation goes. I mean, it's a free-for-all there. There's, there's an uneven balance. I mean, you've got six trained investigators and a mentally deficient, retarded uh, uh, accused. It wasn't a fair fight for Mr. Kellogg in that room. Newspapers back then had close working relationships with the police and were able to publish articles with great detail, almost always provided to them by authorities. On Monday, January 29th, Kellogg bumped the war news down the front page. Kellogg cracked at the end of three hours. He was grilled constantly until 6.15 p.m. when the damaging admission was made that he scuffled with Ms. Wickline near the picket fence when she refused his advances. The Ravenna Evening Record, January 29th, 1945. Kellogg's initial confession, however, was confusing and incomplete. He admitted to scuffling with Wickline, but he also continuously claimed that he never touched or struck her. He said she fell backward and struck her head on the fence post as they tussled. More questioning followed. By 3 a.m., 12 hours after he was brought to the station, he had carefully signed his name on a 20-page confession. The confession document along with most police records from back then, no longer exist, according to police. 
Apparently, Kellogg admitted or intimated that he was trying to accost Wickline. He staunchly denied intentionally trying to kill her. That didn't make a difference, however. Under the law in 1945, if someone died during a robbery or rape attempt, it was murder, first-degree murder, punishable by death. Kellogg ended his confession by telling police he got scared and ran away when Wickline fell and hit her head. He claimed he threw Wickline's purse down a hill toward the Cuyahoga River to make it look like a robbery. It was a sensational case, and local newspapers were caught up with the drama of the confession and the arrest. In a faltering, frightened voice, Kellogg told how he had often watched Miss Wickline leave the store about the same time every night. He reluctantly told all the harrowing details of how he followed his victim down lonely, secluded South River Street, stalking her like a wild animal. The Evening Record. Kellogg's confession and arrest came on the sixth day after the murder. There were only 40 days left in his countdown to justice. Kellogg was bound over to the next month's grand jury session. Asked by reporters for a comment, Kellogg responded, May I have my belt, please? They took it away from me. There was one other bizarre development that morning, now six days after the murder. Two local residents brought to the police station several handfuls of what they said was blood-streaked snow they found near the murder scene. Newspapers had reported that Kellogg told police he stopped to wash blood off his hands in a snowbank after the scuffle with Wickline. The two well-meaning residents had gone looking for it and apparently found something. Police put the snow in an unheated garage behind the police station to protect it from melting or from being contaminated. They said they would send it to a Cleveland crime lab, although there is no indication that happened. No one seemed to be asking a key question. If Kellogg did not touch or hit Wickline, how could he get so much blood on his hands that he would have to wash it off? And why weren't his clothes and shoes covered with blood? A local newspaper reported there was talk of a possible insanity plea given Kellogg's mental issues. And... Police also told reporters there were similarities between Wickline's death and that of Kent's last big murder, the killing of a young woman named Mary Klinko 12 years earlier. The Ravenna newspaper interviewed Kent residents seeking to understand the seemingly innocuous little man who had lived among them all his life. Kellogg's landlady says he was a quiet, gentle man who gave her Christmas presents. A movie theater ticket booth worker says he didn't tidy up enough when he went to the show. Co-workers at the mill reveal that Kellogg was known for telling tall tales and stories about adventures he never had and events that never happened. He would admit to almost any transgression, they said. The newspapers concluded... It seems apparent that Ned Kellogg was plagued with a Jekyll Hyde personality that kept him wavering between two poles of human conduct. He was known as a person who, who uh, told stories, told tall tales, admitted to things that he didn't do that may very well have been part of his mental deficiency. Wickline's purse had not been found and was still considered to be a key piece of evidence. In perhaps the only comedic episode in the whole story, Kellogg offered to show police where he supposedly threw it. The sheriff and police chief took him to South River Street near the old mill. But Kellogg had something very different in mind. He pretended to look for the purse on the snow-covered hillside. Then, suddenly... He scrambled down the slope toward the Cuyahoga River and leaped off a high wall and bolted into the shallow, freezing water. The prisoner crossed the river to the east bank with authorities in hot pursuit. They waded into water to their waists. Kellogg raced back to the west bank, 
breaking through ice in spots and sloshing through unfrozen sections of the river below the dam. The officers were still in pursuit. The evening record, February 8, 1945. The escape attempt never had a real chance of succeeding. Kellogg finally clambered out of the river and was captured near the Main Street Bridge. The purse was not recovered, never has been to this day. The county grand jury returned an indictment against Kellogg for first-degree murder. The county prosecutor promised a trial date in early March, just a few weeks away. Kellogg's attorney did not protest against the short trial date. He also waived a jury trial, no doubt because of the inflamed passions in the town. Kellogg would be tried by a three-judge panel in common police court. The already interesting case was about to get even more so. Now, formally indicted for May Wickline's death, Kellogg tells police he wants to get something off his chest. Three weeks earlier, police had announced that there seemed to be similarities between Wickline's murder and that of another Kent woman 12 years earlier. Kellogg now shocks police. He confesses to that murder as well. Miss Mary Klinko's lifeless body, shorn of clothing and torn by knife wounds, was found in a lonely thicket on Saturday. Akron Beacon Journal, July 24, 1933. In the summer of 1933, Mary Klinko was 23, popular and pretty. She had worked at Black & Decker Electric on Lake Street for three years. She made about $25 a week, had a room a few blocks from the plant, and was engaged to be married. At 5.01 Friday afternoon, July 21st, a sunny, steamy afternoon, she clocked out of work, picked up her pay envelope, and started to walk to her apartment on Sherman Street off Crane Avenue, a quarter mile away. Much of the area between the Black & Decker plant on Lake Street and Crane Avenue was undeveloped in the 1930s. There were few houses, and most present-day streets weren't built yet. Between Klinko's workplace and her apartment, there were acres of fields dotted with dense groves of trees and bramble bushes. There was a narrow path through the woods that folks used as a shortcut between Lake and Crane. Mary Klinko walked into the woods after work on that Friday afternoon. She never made it out. When she had not come home by the next day, a small search party began looking for her. They found her nude body, 50 feet off the path in the woods, tangled in some bramble bushes. She had been choked, stabbed and slashed multiple times, and raped. The police chief expressed the belief that a mentally deranged person may have been responsible for her death. Scratches on her face, torn clothing, and trampled underbrush gave evidence that the girl had struggled desperately. The Ravenna Evening Record July 26, 1933. Police believe she had been attacked and killed around 5.10 in the afternoon, moments after leaving friends and entering the woods. As would be the case 12 years later in the Wickline murder, a police dragnet hauled in almost two dozen tramps, hobos, hermits, and dump dwellers. They questioned a former suitor living in West Virginia and an ex-serviceman in Kent who leaped from his second floor window when authorities tried to question him. Eventually, all were discounted as suspects, and the killing became a cold case. Now, 12 years later, Kellogg told police he was the one who had killed Klinko. Authorities quickly reviewed the old case file and then had Kellogg go through the details again and again. His recall astounded them. Police now asked the local newspaper editor to sit in on one of those interviews as a public representative to attest to the care with which the questioning was conducted. They had not done that in the initial interview on January 28th. The editor, too, was impressed with Kellogg's memory, 
However, he also was aware of Kellogg's mental issue. Police officers were careful throughout their questioning to refrain from the use of threats or other rough tactics in obtaining the details of the crime from this man, who is definitely mentally retarded. Robert Dix, editor, The Evening Record. Police thought the similarities between the two cases were striking. Single women, isolated settings, signs of robbery, violent attacks. Now they were convinced they had just solved two cases with one suspect. Nor was Kellogg done confessing. Police said he told them that a few months earlier, he had tried to rob another woman in Kent. He ran away, he said, when she fought back. The police chief and prosecutor were convinced of Kellogg's culpability. So were area newspapers, which already had convicted Kellogg, psychoanalyzed him, and diagnosed him as a serial rapist. Kellogg's story is both sad and revolting. He actually doesn't intend to hurt anyone, yet when this peculiar force dominates his moves, he appears to proceed against his selected victim without regard for the consequences. The evening record, even with all this hubbub, it could not be that simple, of course. Sure enough, several days later, the case took yet another turn. St. Clair West, who had served as Kent Police Chief in 1933, proclaimed that Kellogg could not have killed Mary Klinko. Police investigating the crime back then had determined that Kellogg was at work at the mill when Klinko was killed, West said. And beyond that, he added, Kellogg was mentally unstable. The former police chief revealed that Kellogg had actually confessed to the crime 12 years earlier, in 1933. The chief said he had not believed Kellogg because of his limited mental capacity and his obvious desire to please the chief. When I questioned Kellogg in 1933, he told me that he committed the murder. But when I asked him why he confessed to the murder, he said, That's what you wanted me to tell you, wasn't it? St. Clair West former Kent police chief. Uh, obviously, the police saw little, if any, merit in the confession. In Mr. Kellogg's case, when he uh, confessed to the 1933 killing, uh, they asked him why, and he says, well, I, I thought that's what you wanted to hear. I'm not sure that I know the, the, uh, the reasons for people doing this, but it's, it's documented now, and uh, there have been significant case studies uh, uh, whereby uh, people have made false confessions and they just have been untrue. Co-workers of Kellogg at the Mill chimed in that he confessed to just about anything over the past 20 years, and he told stories. They said he told them he was released from his short tour of duty in World War I because he had killed his quota of Germans. Kellogg never saw battle action, never went overseas. On another occasion, he said he was particularly tired that morning because he had been up all night patrolling his beat in Akron. Kellogg was never a member of the Akron police force. He, he shared that he was uh, discharged from the Army in, in the First World War, at the end of the First World War, uh, because he killed his quota of Germans. Um, again, saying that may have drawn him a lot of positive attention, even though it wasn't true. If the case wasn't messy enough already, Furman Grubb, police chief in 1945, fired back that there was no record of Kellogg confessing or even being interviewed in 1933. While the two police chiefs squabbled over what Kellogg said, when and to whom, his trial for the murder of May Wickline was drawing nearer. The trial date was set for March 8th, only two weeks away. Even with such a short court date, Kellogg's lawyer, Howard Knapp of Garrettsville, did not protest or seek a continuance or longer trial date to do more preparation for Kellogg's defense. And police did not charge Kellogg in the Mary Klinko murder. Days after accepting, indeed embracing his confession to that crime, they decided to ignore it. After all, they had his confession in the Wickline case.
Less than a week before the trial was to begin, newspapers again ramped up speculation that Kellogg might plead insanity. A key moment in the case was at hand. Under Ohio law, if the defense claimed Kellogg was insane, a hearing would have to be held to determine if Kellogg suffered from a debilitating mental illness that kept him from understanding right from wrong. Retardation, or intellectual disability, however, is an issue of mental health, not an issue of insanity. If the defense did not claim insanity, it still could raise questions about Kellogg's competency to be tried. Competency goes to the issue of whether the person has the uh, mental ability or faculty to uh, understand the nature of, of the proceeding against him or her, understand charges against him or her, and more importantly, maybe most importantly, would be able to assist counsel in his or her defense. The county prosecutor, clearly aware of Kellogg's limited intellectual capacity, decided to take on both the insanity and competency issues. The defense earlier had two local physicians observe Kellogg to assess his mental condition. Both found him sane. Prosecutor Ford now asked two other Portage County general practitioners to examine Kellogg to see if he was both sane and competent. The state's physicians agreed with those for the defense. Kellogg was sane. Three of the four doctors found him competent to stand trial, one expressing doubt that he could capably assist his attorney. All of them also proclaimed he was profoundly mentally retarded. The doctors estimated Kellogg's mental age at between six and nine years of age. Kellogg's intellectual disability notwithstanding, Prosecutor Ford said the trial would begin as scheduled. The courtroom in Ravenna was packed. Those who could not get in waited outside in the hall. Most courtroom observers and members of the public anticipated a lengthy trial. The court session got underway 10 minutes late at 9.40 a.m. Prosecutor Ford gave a short opening statement in which he promised to prove Kellogg killed Wickline with a blunt instrument during a rape attempt. He did not outline any evidence the state planned to present to support its case. Nevertheless, as soon as Ford had finished his brief opening statement, Kedlog's court-appointed attorney rose and surprised almost everyone by ending the trial. Kellogg, he claimed, wished to withdraw his plea of innocent and plead guilty. No reason was given. The chief judge, however, did ask Kellogg did you cause the death of May Wickline? Kellogg, neatly dressed in a blue suit, replied without emotion, I did. The court accepted the guilty plea. The trial was over by 9.50 a.m. It had lasted 10 minutes. No testimony, no evidence was ever given by the prosecution or defense regarding Kellogg's role in the murder of May Wickline, let alone in the death of Mary Klinko. Kellogg's much ballyhooed confession to the Wickline murder was never admitted into evidence where it could have been examined and challenged. Yet, it carried the day for the prosecution. The court then moved into the sentencing phase of the case. The four physicians who had examined Kellogg presented their findings. Defense attorney Howard Knapp asked the judges for justice with mercy. Prosecuting attorney Ford then addressed the court. I don't believe that I could, with good conscience, ask for electrocution for that boy. And I do not believe that the people of Portage County would want me to. I believe that good conscience and good justice will be served if he is removed from society forever by imprisonment without chance of pardon or parole. C. Rary Ford. The court then adjourned for the day.
The three-judge panel had three options, death in the electric chair, life imprisonment, or life imprisonment with no hope of pardon or parole. The court agreed with Knapp and four. It sentenced Kellogg to life imprisonment in the Ohio Penitentiary without any opportunity for pardon or parole. Clearly, if this was a child of six to nine years of age standing before the court and having committed this terrible crime, the court could not properly impose the sentence of death upon such a child. Even though in calendar years this man may be 51 years of age, he has actually the mind of a child. He will be removed from the community forever. Blake Cook, presiding judge. Newspapers reported that Kellogg seemed surprised and agitated at the sentence. Kellogg displayed considerable emotion when he learned his punishment. Standing before the three-judge panel, he nervously rubbed his hands together. The Kent Courier Tribune. Kellogg was returned to the county jail and taken to Columbus the next morning. The brutal slain and Mary Klinko, 12 years earlier, would remain unsolved to this day. 46 days after the death of the popular drugstore clerk, that case, like Klinko's, was closed. It's 70 years now since the Wickline murder, more than 80 since Klinko was killed. Major players in the cases have passed away. Yet questions remain as to Kellogg's culpability in the killings. Did he murder one of the women, both of them, or neither of them? Issues also remain regarding Kellogg's competency to be tried. And there are questions about the actions of other players in the drama as well. Of all the participants in the 46-day investigation and prosecution of Kellogg, only the three-judge panel seemingly acted in a manner appropriate and without controversy. They followed the standard legal protocols of the time. There are many people who believe the intellectually disabled should not be held responsible for some of their actions and should not be punished. In recent years, the U.S. justice system, all the way to the Supreme Court, has grappled with the problem, particularly in capital cases. It remains a muddy and controversial area. The three choices of punishment the judges considered were Ohio law in 1945. Because of the change in plea, the court did not get to evaluate any evidence or any of Kellogg's confessions. Kellogg's court-appointed attorney, however, seems to have provided perfunctory legal representation. He helped Kellogg avoid the electric chair, though the prosecution and court clearly leaned in that direction anyway. His witness list for the trial included only the two local doctors who examined Kellogg's sanity. He forfeited the opportunity to challenge what meager evidence the prosecution might have had or the intense interrogation of Kellogg. Given the fact that there wasn't anything done or, or appeared to be done by, by defense counsel. I mean, Mr. Knapp could have asked for a continuance of trial. It just would have been an opportunity for Mr. Knapp to maybe have a better, more comprehensive look at the case and feel more comfortable with respect to the decision or the advice that he was going to give Mr. Kellogg. That leaves the police. In 1945, as well as in 1933, they were working hard to protect the public. They used the investigative and interrogation techniques available and allowed to them back then. But it was a small force with limited experience in major crimes. One history of Kent notes that the police force in the 1940s consisted of a chief and three patrolmen. That was not enough to handle just the growing parking and traffic problems, a report on the department claimed. The Kent chief publicly considered calling in help in the Wickline murder. They were concerned they did not have the manpower or the forensic expertise to carry out such a complex and time-consuming murder investigation. It was a very small police department. Uh, they, they had a very 
um, high-level felony case here, uh, something that didn't happen with any great frequency, but a very disturbing type of situation. It may have been beyond their capacity or kin to uh, properly investigate it. Police certainly seem relieved when someone finally could be charged. Their investigation of dozens of comers and goers in the busy railroad town had netted no leads or suspects. Residents of the small town had been in a high state of anxiety over the murder. The police worked quickly and may have been a bit too eager to believe Kellogg once he cracked under their grilling. They may have been concerned about confusing him with their questions, but only to the extent that his confusion might muddle their case. The, the confession is the holy grail for prosecutors and police. And uh, oftentimes, uh, once they're able to obtain a confession, uh, their work on a case uh, generally or, or literally stops. That may very well have been uh, the case here in, in, the, in the Kellogg case. They also apparently never considered the possibility that Kellogg might be lying or confessing just to please them or draw attention to himself. A tendency in some people with uh, mild intellectual disabilities is that they can be suggestible, if that's the correct word. So uh, depending on the questions that those uh, police detectives ask and how they asked over statements they made, may have made suggestions to him which he in turn affirmed and in fact reiterated back to them. Well, wh why were you in that tussle? Were you, were, were you making sexual advances to her? Um, you, you were interested, you wanted to rape her. Um, and, and then she resisted your adva advances, so you did what? You pushed her. There, I, there might be some suggestion there. Still, with the general lack of understanding of mental health issues 70 years ago, it's not surprising the police did not give Kellogg's condition much consideration. I think it would have been very difficult to uh, su suppress Ned Kellogg's confession in 1945 as opposed to uh, attempting it uh, today. We didn't have the clinical definition of the mentally retarded. We didn't understand all of the things uh, that uh, are attributable to them with respect to how easily they can be led or convinced um, uh, to, pr to provide information. Um, moreover, there was no case law that went to the issue of voluntariness uh, in 1945, uh, whether he was making a knowing and intelligent and voluntary statement. Kellogg's confession was all Kent police had in 1945, and it was a confession given after six officials subjected an intellectually disabled man to hours of intense questioning a three-hour interrogation by six people would be intimidating to anyone, any layperson, certainly, and probably very intimidating to someone in Mr. Kellogg's situation who had uh, uh, diminished capacity. Police had no substantive forensic evidence, no murder weapon, no stolen purse, no fingerprints, no blood evidence, no polygraph was administered. Kellogg's jacket, thought to have had tiny blood stains along with the curious six-day-old blood streak snowball, supposedly were sent to a Cleveland crime lab. Apparently, the crime lab results never panned out, let alone pointed a finger at Kellogg. If they had, the prosecution's list of witnesses for the trial should have contained experts to explain any damning forensic evidence. There were no such experts on the list, only the doctors and local residents. Uh, they didn't have a lot there. There, was, there were no witnesses, there were no eyewitnesses to any incident. They apparently didn't have any forensic evidence. But they had the wherewithal and the ability to uh, type blood. They had uh, uh, medical evidence uh, to determine more specifically the type of blunt trauma that uh, May suffered. They also had uh, uh, fingerprint analysis, and, and they also you keep in mind that uh, polygraph was alive and well in 1945. I mean, modern polygraph was invented in 1924. They had the ability uh, to uh, submit Mr. Kellogg to a polygraph if, if they wanted to. Absent Kellogg's confession, they would have found themselves in the same situation as local police trying to solve the murder of Mary Klinko in 1933. No real suspects, and time passing by quickly. 
Kellogg's confessions are quicksand. Both of Kellogg's confessions seems plausible, full of convincing detail, detail he could have picked up by merely listening to numerous conversations at work and around town. Both confessions also may be challenged as the products of a mentally deficient man aiming to please and seeking attention, even if that attention was negative. Engaging in behavior, maybe like even the peeping Tom or exposing oneself or telling tall tales, um, what that could have gained him was attention, of which he probably normally wasn't the recipient of. In 1933, he supposedly confessed to the rape and murder of Klinko, but he was not believed. Twelve years later, he again confessed to Klinko's murder. This time, he was believed. Police were so sure, they announced the Klinko case had finally been solved. Then, they changed their minds. His confession in the Wickline case was not only believed, but taken pretty much at face value by both prosecution and defense. Mr. Kellogg, in 1933, had admitted to the 33 killing, and they didn't believe him then. But then when they interviewed him in 1945, they were quick to believe him at that time. I think, if anything, that gives you a window of the attitude of the police and the interrogators in 1945 when they were going after Mr. Kellogg. Ned Kellogg's role in the Wickline and Klinko cases remains a puzzle. Kellogg himself, an enigma. Even 70 years ago, people weren't sure if or how Kellogg fit in either case. Several observers are of the opinion that the Kent mill worker tells fanciful stories and that he is willing to confess to almost any deed. Other authorities are convinced that he knows too many facts in both cases not to be connected to them. The Kent Courier Tribune. What I find striking is there's, there's no previous record of any violent behavior. And suddenly out of, you know, what, 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 was he 52 years older or something thereabouts when that crime occurred? Um, that, that seems somewhat strange that, that someone would become significantly that violent when there's no previous record of him having any uh, interactions, uh, violent interactions with the community. The entire case, from Wickline's death to Kellogg's sentencing, took only 46 days. Resolving a, a, a capital murder case within that period of time, in and of itself, uh, is not necessarily damning, given the circumstances. I think that it should have been put a little more under the microscope than what it was. There, 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 there kind of was a rush to judgment here in the, in the Kellogg case, uh, or a rush to conviction and sentence. For area residents, the case ended when two sheriff's deputies drove Kellogg to Columbus on Saturday morning, March 10th. In the end, just who was Ned Kellogg? Was he a vicious, hot-tempered rapist and murderer? Or was he a hapless, storytelling scapegoat? Only three people know the answer, and they no longer can tell us. Mm -hmm.